Hello everyone, I'm Paolo Casale from Helmholtz Munich. Um, it's uh, the, my first time here at CGSI and yeah, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been around now, this is the second week I've uh, been around. It's been really fun, lots of uh, great connections and interesting scientific discussions and also fun activities. Uh, great, really great to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about mixed models uh, to assess heterogeneous genetic effects across genomic and imaging datasets. And I mostly focus on uh, applications to genomic datasets. And uh, maybe if, if we have some time, I will talk about one application to an imaging dataset. Before uh, getting to the topic, though, I want to provide a bit of background, which will also give me the opportunity of telling you uh, what, what we do in the lab um, uh, at Helmost. Um, so as you, as you all know in this audience, um, the last 20 years, um, genome-wide association studies have been really successful. Uh, we identified thousands of variants associated with complex traits and human disease. Um, however, for most of the loss that we identified through GWAS, we don't know, we don't know what they do. We don't know what's, uh, what's the cell type been involved, we don't know what's the tissue, we don't know what's the biological process that gets uh, affected, ultimately leading to the manifestation of disease. And um, nowadays, um, uh, uh, I like claiming that we have the right depth of uh, phenotypic data uh, to actually start looking into these questions. So we now measure alongside with genetic data. Um, we have single cell uh, gene expression data sets, uh, uh, large cohorts of medical imaging data, uh, and also several uh, clinical readouts and uh, disease biomarkers. And of course now with these uh, large genetic cohorts, we have uh, new opportunities. We can study how genetic variants affect these intermediate phenotypes and maybe learn something about uh, how disease manifests and develops. Uh, we can identify uh, new disease biomarkers uh, for early detection and for monitoring disease progression. And we can also uh, study how these genetic effects depend on different um, environmental uh, exposures that we are uh, subject to, um, something that's known uh, as G by E interaction. Of course, these uh, opportunities uh, come along with uh, uh, several challenges. We focus mostly on computational challenges. Uh, we need methods that are robust and scalable uh, to handle these large sample size. We need effective uh, strategies to analyze uh, high content uh, phenotypes, uh, high dimensional phenotypes like medical images. Um, and we need models that are interpretable, especially if we think about uh, the application of uh, machine learning models to statistical genetics problems. And um, in the lab, we uh, focus on these uh, uh, computational challenges, developing new tools, borrowing ideas from uh, statistical methods and machine learning uh, methodology. Uh, but today, I'm going to focus on uh, methods to study context-dependent effects, uh, mainly G by E, um, and on the challenge of addressing robustness and scalability of these methods uh, for analysis of in large bar banks. And I'll uh, touch upon um, this uh, problem of dealing with uh, high content uh, phenotypes such as medical imaging. Okay, so I'm going to start by presenting a mixed model approach uh, after introducing the, 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 con the main concept of G by interaction. I'm going to use a, a mixed model approach that can be used to test for G by E interactions with multiple environments. Um, and the first application that we'll look uh, into is, uh, is in, in the uh, UK Bell Bank where we're going to analyze uh, BMI as a trait and gene environment interaction with different lifestyle covariates. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to uh, change, uh, change topic a bit and um, discuss an application of the same type of methodology uh, to test uh, cell context specific interaction in, in, um, um, in expression EQTL datasets. And then um, finally, um, I want to also touch upon uh, what I think being a new paradigm uh, to uh, phrase this interaction uh, G by e tests uh, using attention-based mixed models and borrowing from this concept of attention that is now uh, a mainstream in, in machine learning. Great, so let me start by uh, saying what the gene environment interaction is. Um, so the FTO locus has been uh, robustly associated with the BMI um, and the, uh, the risk is a risk allele increasing BMI. And here in this figure that's from this paper published a few years ago in Nature Communication, uh, we can see the effect of BMI uh, as 
uh, as a function of the number of copies on the, disc, uh, the FTO risk alleles. And here the population is satisfied in two groups. Uh, people who are less active, they are active zero to three days a week. And people that are more active, are active from four to seven. And as you can see, the effect of the FTO risk allele uh, varies between the two groups. That's how a gene environment actually looks like. And we can, we can use a standard linear model to test for it. Um, so typically the, the trait here, BMI, is the outcome in this model. And then we have a linear contribution from genetics. In this case, the uh, genotype at the FTO risk allele, a, a contribution from the environment, it would be this binary uh, environment, less active, more active, and then a, a gene environment interaction, um, and finally, uh, Gaussian noise. And this gene environment interaction here, this product is a Hadamard product, is an element-wise multiplication between the variance of the G, of the genotype vector and the environment vector, and you can test for these differential effects across these two groups by testing whether the weight gamma is significantly different from zero. And that's the standard simple model to test for interaction uh, with, a, with a simple environmental, with a single environmental variable. Now, for the same variant, it's been shown that this, uh, this, its effect also depends on diet, uh, uh, sleep, and other covariates. And hence the questions, if we now consider um, um, deep phenotypic data, like those available in UK Bell Bank, where we have hundreds of uh, related candidate environments that may drive a G by interaction, uh, how can we develop a test to, uh, to, to effectively uh, test for interaction with all these different Im environmental uh, covariates. And, um, in, in UK Bell Bank, we have example of uh, activity, phenotypes, uh, smoking, uh, diet, and other lifestyle factors. And these also are correlated to each other. Um, and there's sort of a, an environmental sample structure uh, in, intrinsic in the data. So to address this problem, um, we proposed now a few years ago, uh, Struct LMM, which is a, a mixed model approach uh, to test for uh, gene environment interactions with multiple environments. Um, and is here I'm uh, going to go through the model uh, in detail. Um, so that's uh, very similar to the model I was showing you before. There are uh, two main differences. The first difference is that this uh, um, environment effect now is a result of uh, different environments that we want to include in the model, say different uh, lifestyle covariates that we have access to. Um, and the way uh, we model this effect is through a random effect uh, where the covariance structure of this variable is a, is a linear covariance of the candidate environment. So you can think that uh, this uh, environment effect is uh, uh, on two, the environment effect on two individuals is similar um, if their exposures uh, are similar. And we use the same modeling framework also for the effect of the genetic variant on the trait. Uh, so in this case, the effect of the genetic variant is, is, is a vector that varies across each individual in the population. And we also model this as a random effect where the covariance matrix also follows the same structure. And this framework is, is actually pretty nice because if we, if we go back and we consider a single environment, environmental factor, uh, like a binary uh, activity um, level uh, covariate, then we, we go back to the case of where we have two groups and this covariance becomes a block covariance. Uh, uh, but this is more general. We can also model group hierarchy um, and finally, this case where we have multiple environments and the sample structure uh, uh, the, uh, between the samples in the population. And so we can use this model for doing two types of tests. We can test for association with the genetic variant while accounting for gene environment interaction. That's a test for both beta different from zero and uh, the variance component of this, uh, of this vector being different from zero. And, and um, also we can test specifically for interaction effects with the multiple environments by a variance component test. And after, for significant associations interaction we find, we can uh, also uh, compute subject level genetic effects so that we can get the posterior distribution over gamma and identify which individuals uh, have stronger genetic effects from that variance based on their exposome. Now, uh, this model uh, naively scales cubically with the number of samples so to achieve speed. We use the fact that in most cases when we deal with the uh, large bell banks, the number of environments is uh, much lower than the number of individuals. So the total 
uh, covariance is, can be written as a low rank uh, plus identity matrix, and there's a series of tricks that one can use. Uh, we also use a variance component test that only requires fitting the null model uh, to, to be even faster. So, but in this talk, yeah, I'll focus mostly on the interaction effect test. Okay, so in simulations show calibration and power of struct LMM. Uh, yeah, I think here the main takeaway is that if you compare struct LMM versus uh, a single environment interaction test, uh, the struct LMM model performs uh, well independently on the number of active environments, while uh, the, the, the power of the single environment model uh, quickly deteriorates as the number of single environment uh, 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 increases. So we apply this to um, um, the UK event data set focusing on BMI, um, and uh, we consider a cohort of 250,000 individuals um, focusing on 97 risk loci for BMI that were previously identified in the, uh, in the GWAS in the giant data set. And we, uh, as lifestyle covariates, we consider 64 uh, different environments. Uh, these are uh, 12 dietary variables, three physical activity variables, alcohol intake, sleep covariates, and their interactions with uh, age and sex. This is an example of the type of sample, sample uh, structure that you get uh, across these 64 different environments for a subset of the population. So um, as the, the results of the real data confirm what we found in simulation, if we compare the uh, interaction test p-value that we get from the, this multi-environment uh, uh, GBA test from struct MM versus the single environment test, uh, we, we discover more. We find four loss high set of two uh, at a fairly wise rate 5%. And if we go a bit more lenient and consider FTR 5% threshold, we discover uh, even more, more signals. And the, this, um, this is an example of how drastic the, the, the improvement in power can be. Uh, that's an example for MC4R. Um, in which the, we have a very strong signal uh, for the stack element model, but if you consider the best uh, exposure and the single environment G by test for this exposure, this drops significantly. So what the, let's go back. So what, what's like the explanation for this? Do you have an explanation for this in this case? Why, why yeah. are you specifically gain more power? Or? Yes. Um, it, but likely these, uh, these uh, interactions are driven by multiple environments. We have also have some downstream analysis showing that. And so by leveraging, by doing the test, aggregating all environments together, it is more powerful than considering each environment in isolation. Similar to how a variance component test of multiple variants uh, would be more powerful than, than, than a single variant G was in specific settings. It's a good question. I think for the main application is, the, is under the same sample size, but we also tried um, um, if you don't suffer from this, this, uh, this loss in samples due to the fact that you drop individuals from which you don't have all environments and that the power, uh, the power benefits, they, they remain. It's a good point, yes. Uh, when if you, if you start thinking the more variables you, 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 you add, then the more you may suffer by sample size. But that is where, we didn't do that, but that is where methods like uh, phenotype prediction methods can come in and, and help. Correct. This is the main, yeah, the main application we consider that. Yeah, yeah. So we started from the whole uh, a related set uh, in the UK Bank, and then yes, considering. So you don't have missing net here. No, not in the main, not in the main results and present. Yes. Yes. Great. And then uh, a few of those three analyses you can do. You can get a posterior over the um, allylic effects uh, for each individual in the cohort, and here we're showing the distribution. And uh, yes, uh, you can see this very uh, substantially. And we could replicate uh, these differences in other sample by uh, predicting other sample. And, and yes, and this can be used to, f to identify high risk individuals uh, um, carrying a specific genotype. Um, and also, another thing that you can do, we use a, a backward elimination procedure to understand uh, whether we needed all these environments to actually explain to 
to capture uh, the, the whole evidence of the G by E effect. And so by, by, doing this, by doing that, we were eliminating consecutively the, the exposure that, uh, uh, for which we had least evidence based on the, on the bias factor. And with that, we could bridge uh, the whole environment model to a single environment model. And we, we can see that you need many different exposures to be able to capture the G by E that really uh, underlines the, the benefits of, of this multi G by E uh, um, um, test uh, in this setting. Yes. Um, so yes, in order to fit the posterior, yes, you need to fit the full model. Uh, so yeah, to, 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 to infer for these petitions, you need to fit the full model. Yeah, so we also get estimates of the G by E. Uh, term. Yes. And you have, like, a sense of how much, like, what, what are the magnitudes of these effects when you fit all environments? Good question. I, I don't have the answer now. I, I, I wouldn't know. Um, Mm -hmm. Then, on the mixed model framework, we can estimate like a SNP heritability by fitting a GRM. Yes. And you can fit like an ERM using your method. Have you, have you tried that? I'd just like to see how much variance is sort of contributed to that first genetic model. People, people have done that. I think Andy Dahl has a method doing this across uh, multiple genetic variants and multiple environments. But this is designed for single variant G by E. Uh, interaction test with multiple environment, so so n not in yeah. this work. Yeah. I know that you uh, already mentioned that you used the sorted here. Uh, have you compared to what like the question tests? How much how are you missing things? So we did a bit uh, a comparison. I think it mostly depends on on how strong is the effect uh, that you're testing for. So I think for weak effects, the score tests tend to be uh, tend to have a higher power compared to a log ratio test. But for, for stronger effect, we see we see the other way around. Uh, yeah, score test was a good compromise when when having to wanting to keep uh, most of the score power it was we would, but also having a, a scalable and fast method. So for these effects, yeah, it's uh, very comparable results. And I think the score test was also higher power to, for for most settings. So, so Lincoln, you also did a previous work where you tried to uh, you know, linear combinations of factors or whatever. Did you try yeah. that? Just, you know, you can see. Uh, so you... Well, is there, is there a particular you know, factor or combination of these environmental exposures that, that explains most of these effects? So exactly, I mean, this, this model basically, it is a linear model in, uh, in the G by E. Since everything is linear, you could in principle, uh, yeah, it's, like, it's like having a G by matrix E and many G by E, and, and, basically, and then you have the weights of these different G by E on one by one. So it's, it's an equivalent model. So getting, um, yeah, you can get a posterior over, over the, the FX size of the H, each single G by E. And uh, one way of interpreting the posterior over this gamma parameter is exactly the aggregate exposure, the, which is a linear combination of different environmental variables. Yeah. What happens if there is heteroscedasticity as a function of your environmental factors? Uh, good question. Um, I think our model assumes no heteroscasticity, but um, what, what would happen if you have very strong is that you may have slightly inflated results. Uh, and yeah, so um, yeah, that's something that it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a potential bias that you could have in, in non heteroscasticity scenarios, yeah. A lot of these weight trades, there's a comment I made many years ago to Oli Stegel, which was using similar methodology yeah, this is this is work with oh, oil. Okay, yeah, this is this. Yeah, the weight related traits have a huge variance difference between male and female. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we. What, what reason? Yeah, just an example. If that's if you see that as an exposure. Uh, we, so this is work with Oli, and yeah, yeah, we, yeah the, we, we looked into this specifically okay. for, for the for the most. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. uh, this uh, this paper here. Yeah, the, the Oli is uh, is last on this. Uh, okay. So probably it probably is the same same line of work here.
Yeah, so the question I think concerns if you have uh, interaction between environments also on top, uh, would this method be calibrated? Um, yes, I don't think, yes. I, I, we, we, we looked at the series of model mismatches, uh, and this was one of that. We didn't see any inflation of the model uh, on E by E by G interactions, let's say, if we simulated that. Um, at the same time, what may be uh, not uh, accurate, not, not as accurate is the, the, the estimate of the posterior uh, over this, uh, this aggregate ex ex exposure. Because it's uh, ultimately we make the assumption that this is a linear combination of, of, of the of the environments, and if that's not the case, because there is a, also an E by interaction, uh, yeah, we wouldn't capture that. Um, I wouldn't say fully explored, but we looked into this. I think it's, uh, um, it's a lot of model mismatches that can happen. I think in, uh, the way we address specifically in the real data example, that we consider also E by E interactions, specifically uh, between all these variables and also age, uh, sex. And so we certify this is by uh, this, this measure, um, uh, the covariates that, that, that they drive heterogeneity. Uh, so yes, that's the way we address that. Sorry, can, can you speak up? Um, it's a good question. I mean, in this case, we, we focused on, I, th I think it really breaks down to when this method uh, can be helpful, right? And when you can, you can learn something. Because if you, if you expand your, your uh, E too much and you put a lot of variables, maybe you find G by E, but then what does it mean? And in this case, uh, we, that, in this case we really focused on, on, on lifestyle covariates. And so many of these, they tend to occur and you can find a set of individuals that have a more risky lifestyle, let's say, and, and, and that, that, that's the way in this case you would, you would, you would use this, uh, uh, this type of insights. Yeah. And these things, they, they do tend to occur, occur at the specific subsets of individuals. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's also similar. I mean, sometimes you may also not have in your set the actual driving uh, environment, right, for the G by E. But since you have all these different proxy environments that are noisy and they capture healthy versus unhealthy lifestyle, you, you can get a, a better proxy of it. I think that's also one use case of why this, this, this model may work better than single exposure models. Great. Um, OK, so I think it was great to get uh, all the questions on that slide because uh, um, ready to conclude the first part. So introduce a, a stacked LMM, um, a mixed model approach to test for gene environment interactions with multiple environments, and, and demonstrate its utility to study genetic interactions with lifestyle covariates in large pair banks. Um, and now I want to switch gears a bit and, and, and tell you about how one can use this um, G by E interaction test with multiple exposure to test for cell context interactions in, in EQTL mapping, which I think is, is another, is another uh, strong use case of this type of methodology. Um, so uh, this variant is an intronic variant in the um, uh, GSDMA gene. And um, in the Fairfax et al. paper, it was published in Science uh, now 10 years ago almost, um, we, we could see no association, uh, they could see no association between the expression of the gene GSDMA and the genotype of this variant. However, if you uh, stimulate monocytes with lipopolysaccharide for two hours, you can see a very strong EQTL effect. And this is an example of a cell context interaction um, in EQTL mapping. So the, this variant uh, uh, regulates expression of the, of the GSDMA gene only upon stimulation with lipopolysaccharide. And it's really important sometimes to interpret uh, the, uh, in which the cellular context in which a, a GWAS locus may affect the expression of a gene. Um, 
But in EQTL datasets, many times we don't have information about the cellular context. And so the, the, the question I want to make here, can we use these uh, uh, multi-exposure uh, uh, testing models, like TLMM, to identify context-specific EQTLs when, where the, the, the cell context isn't, isn't known? And uh, if we can, can we also use these, uh, these uh, um, uh, posterior um, aggregate effects that we learn to, to, to also identify relevant cellular contexts? And so we, we apply this to um, bulk RNA-seq uh, data uh, from uh, BIOS. That's in, um, we had data for 2,040 samples. Um, and we built our um, exposure matrix using 443 highly variable genes uh, in this data set. Um, and we, we, we use gene expression to build these covalence matrix under the assumption that gene expression capture the cell type composition for these different samples. Um, and then we focused our analysis on uh, 23,000 uh, CCQTLs. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, we, and we, we identified uh, context-specific QTLs at 5% for about 3,500 of them, and 60 of them co-localized with the disease loci. And, and uh, then we used this posterior over the, uh, the individual uh, level genetic effects to also uh, get some insights onto candidate uh, driving biological processes. And so that's the model, the structural and model. And I think the only thing that I'd like to highlight here that now uh, I refer to this uh, environment as a context, a cellular context, um, and that these uh, covariance matrices, these um, uh, sample by sample covariance matrices, are now built based on genome-wide special levels, focusing on uh, 443 highly variable genes. Okay, so I um, want to show one example, uh, um, which I think is, is interesting. So this is a, 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 an EQTL for catepsin W, and um, is a, a risk locus for Crohn's disease. And, and uh, using SACTLMM, we, we find a very strong uh, context-specific interaction, uh, very low p-value. And if we, we can also uh, use the model to get uh, to estimate this uh, subject-level genetic effect. So we can plot the expression of the gene versus the subject-level genetic effect. Here, each point is a sample, and we can stratify the individuals based on their genotypes. And if we want to bridge this uh, back to the binary uh, ex exposure case, uh, we could consider, for example, the uh, individuals which, has the, which had the, the lowest uh, uh, genetic effects, individuals with the top genetic effects. And here you can see that across these two uh, set of individuals, you, you have a very uh, different uh, uh, EQTL uh, signal. And um, what we did then to identify candidate uh, 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 biological processes uh, is we, we did differential expression with, between these two groups, and then did a pathway relationship analysis on the differential expressed genes. And in some cases, we, we found some, some useful uh, leads. And in this case, uh, we, we identified pathways uh, that points toward uh, uh, the biology of T helper cells, uh, which have been implicated in, in Crohn's disease. So this is just an example. We find uh, uh, many of these and, and uh, characterize different candidate uh, uh, driving pathways uh, for, these, for these interactions. Great. Um, this is um, an extension of the structural MM model to uh, single cell EQTL mapping. Uh, this is not from a lab, this is a, a follow up work from Oliver Stegel's uh, group, um, where in this um, uh, extension of the model, you can now uh, instead of doing the modeling at the single individual level, you do the modeling at the single cell level. Um, and uh, you can use cell reg map now to estimate allelic effects in single cells. Uh, so you can identify uh, in which cells uh, the, the, the genotype variant is most active. This is, hello? The new batteries are. Yes, I think the batteries are. <laughs> With it, would it, uh, uh, does it work if I sp speak louder? Yeah, okay. The recording will be active. The recording will work, right? It's a different, I think it's a different microphone. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. I, I think, I mean, I have two devices on me. Uh, well, you probably have to wrap up in like three, four minutes. So. Oh, okay, okay, so we're almost <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so I'm going to run through. <laughs> 
I'm going to run through the last thing. I mean, I'm not going to go through all the material then. I'm just going to present a couple of more slides. Um, and one of the, the challenges when doing this modeling at the single cell level is that now you have multiple uh, cells from the same individual. And so you need to account with, for this repeat structure in order to get calibrated p-values. Um, and so you one need to add another uh, random effects that now uh, models the, this repeat structure in the data. And this repeat structure, of course, uh, you can, thanks to this addition, you now get Calbe p-values, and you can test for um, a single cell heterogeneous effects. Uh, but uh, you, you, the, this addition really, really hinders scalability. And so it makes the, this framework uh, scale cubically with the number of individuals. Um, and that's something that I I um, think we, we can address uh, through a new class of methods called, uh, that we call attention-based mixed models. And I want to introduce the idea behind them, and I want to present them as an alternative to a classical G by E interaction test. And I, I'm going to be very brief on this, but I just want to introduce the idea, and then we can, we can discuss this after, after the talk. Um, so this is joint work. Um, between uh, Helmholtz Munich and uh, the um, uh, Endoven University of Technology. And the main idea is that to, to uh, reuse this um, uh, concept of attention, which is mainstream in machine learning, for interaction testing. Um, so um, single cell, the, the main application is single cell data set, where we observe uh, multiple cells, typically thousands of cells, from the same individual. And in this data set, it's going to be the main application of this method, 1K, 1K. We have 1,000 cells from 1,000 individuals. That's the name 1K, 1K. Um, and so we phrase this as a multi-instance problem, because we have thousands of cells from an individual by its single genome. So the multi-instance corresponds to the multiple cells from that individual. We still have context specificity here. Uh, only cells of a given cell type or in a given cellular state, they may exhibit some transcriptional changes that are associated with a genetic variant. Uh, the EQTL, for example, may be active only in a subset of, of a specific cell type. Um, and uh, we also build on the concept of single cell embedding, which are uh, compact, compact representations of the transcriptional state of a cell. Um, the easiest way of thinking about them is to uh, one can focus on highly variable genes across single cells and then take the top PCs as a, to capture the transcriptional state of single cells. Um, and so what, what we, we do, we introduce a, a, a mixed model approach with attention. So in this case, the input data is a bag of instance embeddings, cell embeddings, and we have a single uh, label for the whole bag, uh, a genotype. And one very simple thing we could do, we could consider the average of all these uh, cell embeddings and then use a, a, a mixed model uh, where we have the genotype as an outcome and this cell embedding as an input and model uh, their weights as a random effect. And yes, we could test for uh, the, the variance uh, component of this random effect being different from zero. What we suggest instead is, uh, is to introduce an attention mechanism in which we have a linear model plus softmax that give us for each instance, for each cell, we get an importance weight. How important this cell is to predict for this prediction problem, to, to predict the genotype. Um, and then we use these weights uh, to compute a weighted average that ultimately uh, builds up our, our random effect. And the nice thing of this model is that uh, we can uh, put a prior on the, on the weights of this linear uh, model and, and uh, by modulating the, if you, we, we obtain the, the simple mean model as a special case of this attention mix model. Uh, so if we, if we set this variance component being zero, uh, all the weights will collapse to one. Uh, so every cell will be weighted the same in this average and we go back to the average pooling model. So we apply, um, I'm gonna be very brief here. So we apply this model on the uh, 1K, 1K. Uh, and we show that we can uh, use it to detect significant uh, G by E interactions. And uh, similar to CEREC map, we can also uh, get attention maps uh, so we can um, visualize which cells are important to predict the genotype. And that's a, 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 different, way of a different way of phrasing a, a G by E interaction test. Um, I'm going to wrap up. I think I'm out of time. So we also apply this to imaging. Uh, 
we won't have time to talk about these, but uh, happy to follow up. Um, yes, and that leads to conclusion. So yeah, introduce a mixed model um, to test for heterogeneous genetic effects and show utility across two different applications, an application to large bell banks to test for G by E interaction with multiple environments, um, and also a, a cell context interaction effect test on gene expression that also enable to find uh, pathways that are likely to drive uh, the effect of EQTLs in, in single in, in expression data sets. And, and finally, I, I, I very briefly went through a new uh, uh, method for uh, to, to uh, that can be used to phrase the G by interaction test uh, using the concept of attention. Um, and yes, showed some uh, results on single cell data sets. And happy to talk to you more about all these aspects. It was a bit squeezed. Uh, thank you for your patience and I look forward to more questions.